Well, welcome back to our conference. We're jumping now into the book of Daniel for our third, fourth, and fifth message. And we're thinking about uh, living in uh, distressing times, troubling times. How do we uh, live for the Lord during these types of situations? We enjoyed thinking through the book of Habakkuk together and um, the consequences of living by tunnel vision, having a burdened soul versus uh, resting and rejoicing in the Lord and uh, living a life um, really looking forward and upward to what things God would do. So uh, if you haven't done so, turn with me to the book of Daniel. Um, I made a cup of coffee in the break, so I'm ready to go. And hopefully you had a, a little break as well. It says uh, in verse 1, we're just be looking at chapter 1 uh, for this third session. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And I want to pause here just to give us a little bearing on the, the setting and the situation. Habakkuk was preaching... Uh, just a few years uh, before this, possibly even less than a year, somewhere between 605 and 609 BC. The year now is 605 BC. Uh, Pharaoh Necho had uh, replaced Jehoahaz with Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was paying tribute to Egypt. Um, Nebuchadnezzar um, in the Babylonian forces came to Jerusalem and protesting that measure and uh, put a siege to Jerusalem. Um, to save the city, Jehoiakim uh, paid tribute to Nebuchadnezzar, kind of switched sides, so to speak, and allowed Nebuchadnezzar to carry away a lot of the articles of the temple uh, and a number of the people um, in Jerusalem. That's in verse 2. Now, when we look at the captivities of Jerusalem in this time frame, this was the first major deportation of Jews. Um, probably 10,000 captives uh, during the um, rebellion of Jehoiachin in 597 BC. Uh, that would be the second deportation of captives, and then there would be a third major deportation in 588 BC when uh, Nebuchadnezzar would come a third time, besiege the city for 18 months and it was destroyed as well as a temple. So three major deportations. Um, in the this chapter we have the first deportation in 605 BC, uh, 10,000 captives in the second deportation in 597 BC that was in response to Jehoiachin's rebellion. He was hauled away in chains and taken to Babylon then. That's likely when the prophet Ezekiel was taken to Babylon. And then uh, the third deportation after the city fell in 588 BC. So when Habakkuk was giving his message, uh, Daniel was probably only 8 to 12 years old, somewhere in that, that range. And so we're introduced to Daniel here in a few verses. Uh, he would be a teenager and uh, we're going to see that living in difficult times uh, can be a rewarding experience and Daniel is going to show us in this uh, chapter. So the Lord gave, verse 2, gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand, that's Nebuchadnezzar's hand, with some of the articles of the house of God which he carried into the land of Shinar and the house of his God. And he brought the articles to the treasure house of his God. The king instructed Asaphaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Now the master of the eunuchs, this fulfills Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah 39.7, in that young men would be taken from um, Israel in the deportation to Babylon and made eunuchs. And so we see kind of the who's who of young men of the who's who in Israel are taken to Babylon with this deportation. 
It says, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had ability to serve the king's palace, whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end that time they might serve before the king. And so Babylon took the best out of Israel. They, they took young men that were good looking, gifted, wise, understanding, quick learners, intelligent, uh, those who had instruction and language and literature and would be able to serve the king. And they would go through a three year training process to learn the language of the Chaldeans. And at the end of that time, the king would examine them and um, give them a appropriate placement in his uh, cabinet or in his service. And then we read in verse 6, Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah. Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah Abednego. And I want to pause here. Um, we understand that Satan is the god of this age. He's the prince and power of the world. Three times the Lord Jesus called him the prince of this world or the ruler of this world. It's his domain. It's a fallen domain. Uh, Satan uh, acts within the boundaries that God gives him. Um, but he is the prince and power of the year. The Lord Jesus said, if he be lifted up speaking the cross, he would draw them into him and the prince of this world would be cast down. His hold on them would be cast down. And so we understand that much of the world's agony, much of the distress in the world is being instigated by satanic forces that are opposing the will of God and God's sovereign rule. And I would like to suggest to you that the enemy has four things that he would like from us, as demonstrated by Daniel chapter 1. First of all, um, the devil wants our natural abilities. These young men had incredible abilities. They looked good. Uh, they were wise. They were um, knowledgeable. They were fast learners, intelligent. And the devil would love for us to use our abilities to honor his system and his ways. And so many people are, uh, that have been caught up into intellectualism, skepticism, have done that very thing. So God has given us abilities. He's given a believer spiritual gifts to serve him. Uh, the devil would like nothing better than for us to use the things that God has given us to oppose the things of God. Uh, that is the ultimate rebellion, which he, um, he was the first rebel, and he's casting doubt on the word of God, the person of God, trying to cause us to rebel against our creator. Uh, secondly, the devil wants to control our communication, what comes out of our mouth. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so when we speak, if the graciousness of, of Christ is coming out, the truth of God is coming out, obviously God's name will be honored, people will be one to Christ, and we are furthering the kingdom of God. But if the speech of the devil is coming out, uh, worldliness, um, cursings, gossip, slander, um, doubtings, things that create panic and anxiety, doubt, uh, instead of gracious words that are founded in truth. These are the things that he would like to, uh, to have. Then, um, and that includes literature too. The devil wants us to read his stuff. And because uh, what we're put our minds thinking on, that's eventually what's going to come out of our mouth. 
I, I like the little saying, the tongue is the tail of the heart which wags out of the mouth. Whatever we're meditating on, pondering on, and here eventually comes out here. And so the more that the devil can keep us looking at and reading and thinking about things that are honoring to him, filthy, lustful, lascivious, sensual, those kinds of things, that's the things that are going to come out of our mouth. Um, what we think upon is, is what's going to determine how we speak. And then the third thing is um, God wants us, or the devil wants us to compromise holiness. The Jews were under strict dietary laws. Uh, Daniel would have been taught these from an early age. Later in the book, in chapter 6, we find out that he was praying three times a day. And he was a man in his early 80s at this time, his whole life. Uh, well, he had been instructed as that as a child. He was probably taken to Babylon somewhere between ages of 12 and 16. So as a young man, he knew the law. He read the psalm. Uh, David faced Jerusalem when he prayed, prayed three times a day. And so that's what Daniel was doing all of his whole life. And so here are these young men taken to a foreign country under foreign, brutal foreign rule. And now there's all this pressure in these harsh circumstances to get them to compromise the truth. And so um, he wanted them to compromise their strict dietary laws. He wanted them to eat the Turkish delights, so to speak, uh, the king's delicacies, and of wine uh, while they were in training. Well, Leviticus 10.9, Numbers 6.3, drunkenness was always forbidden. Uh, clouds the mind, causes us to lose control. And so Daniel and his friends did not want to eat the king's delicacy. It violated their strict dietary laws. The laws were given to the Jews to show them a peculiar people from among all people. And so the idea was to get them to fit in and be like everyone else and uh, compromise what how they ate and drank, uh, probably enter into drunkenness and, and do foolish things. And then uh, fourthly, notice that they exchange names. Now each of these names of the Jews uh, had a name associated with God. Daniel means God is my judge. And so what the enemy does here is he exchanges he tries to exchange the identity of the child of God for something that honors him. And so Daniel's name, God is my judge, is exchanged for Belteshazzar, which means worshiper of Baal. I mean, that couldn't have been anything more insulting to Daniel than to be called Belteshazzar. Here he, he worships the true God, the God uh, Jehovah, the creator of all things. God is his judge, and now he's called a worshiper of Baal. And the same with um, uh, Hananiah. He's called Shadrach. Baal protects his life. Uh, Michelle to Meshach, and Azariah to Abednego. Azariah means Jehovah has helped. And uh, his name is changed as Servant of Nebo. Nebo was the god of uh, one of the gods, major gods of Babylon. And so all four of these uh, godly Hebrew young men had names that honored Jehovah God, and the enemy exchanged, tried to change their identity um, so they would be identified with the false gods of the, of the land. So when we're thinking about living in stressful times, let's remember the enemy's agenda, what he's trying to accomplish. The same stressful days that Daniel lived in and his friends are not unlike the days that we live in. And I would suggest that the enemy, through stressful times, the pressure of time, a constant uh, undertow of wickedness is trying to uh, compromise, get us to compromise on these same four things. The devil wants our natural abilities to serve himself instead of the Lord. 
Um, the devil wants to control our speech and our communication. Uh, the devil wants us to compromise holiness, compromise God's word and what he says is holy um, to adapt a different standard. And God is perfectly holy. He's perfectly true. He's perfectly righteous. There are no um, levels of righteousness with the Lord. We tend to have levels of righteousness and we think, well, that's good enough. Well, God's always here. He's perfect. And so that's not adapt uh, a pseudo holiness standard of holiness uh, what God says is true and pure and it's easy for us to rationalize something less than that but that it's not pleasing to the Lord and then to strip our identity the believers identity is in Christ we're secure in him and the, the enemy knows that if he can rattle us and who we are in Christ and get us to look on our situation circumstances <clears throat> instead of the one that we are unified with that he can get us to compromise so the devil wants our natural abilities he wants our communication and speech he wants us to compromise holiness and he wants to ascribe to us a new identity that we don't understand who we are in Christ and the security of that thankfully uh, Daniel and his friends are not going to have anything to do with us. Uh, they weren't in control of their circumstances, but they could purpose in their heart to do what was right. In verse 8 it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he had drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you will endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies and as you, as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. We'll pause our reading there. Daniel purposed in his heart to take a stand for the Lord and not compromise what he knew was true. He understood that the enemy was using these hard times, distressing times, to try to get him to compromise. And so Daniel and his friends are not willing to compromise. They purposed in their heart not to be defiled. Well, that creates a a hard situation for Daniel and his friends. Uh, they're servants. Uh, their lives can be whisked away in a moment if the king says, put them to death, they will be put to death. And so we see God at work in this situation because God gave favor. He, in the eyes of the chief of the eunuchs, God is working in that man's heart to look favorably and show goodwill to these young Hebrew men. But there's a problem. The young Hebrew men don't want to compromise. But the Babylonian master of the eunuchs is, is concerned about his um, master, Nebuchadnezzar. If he doesn't fulfill his role and what he's been tasked to do, then he might also have his life extinguished. And so the man even tells Daniel this. And Daniel says, well, uh, let's have a test. We'll eat vegetables and drink water for 10 days. Then you can compare us with the other young men who are eating the king's rich, fattening, sweet food and all the merry uh, wine drinking and so forth. And uh, you can compare us and see how our countenance look. And so it was agreed. And now this is not a portion of scripture to promote any kind of a diet, vegan diet, meat-free diet, and so forth. 
Um, the Jews had strict dietary laws, the way meats were prepared, for example, uh, what types of meat they could eat, in order to just sideline all that and not take, um, Gentiles couldn't prepare their meats. Um, they, the meats had to be like a peace offering, por portions of that offered at the temple uh, or by a priest before they could eat it. So just to put all the possibilities of defilement aside, they're just not going to eat meat. They're just going to eat vegetables. They didn't have the dietary laws uh, concerning the vegetables and they're just drinking water. So they're playing it safe. Uh, they don't want to compromise and the chief of the eunuchs agrees to allow this test and uh, Melznar is his name from verse 5. Well at the end of the 10 days there is a comparison and it says in verse 15 their features appear better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Whenever you purpose in your heart to take a stand for the Lord and not compromise, there will be a test. We should expect that. And if we trust in the Lord, then there is a, a victory that will come. And God is uh, with his uh, people here, these young men. They uh, have purposed in their hearts to not be compromised, to obey the truth. Um, as a result, their faith was tested. And because they held to the Lord, and trusted him, victory was assured. And so they looked great after 10 days. It says in verse 16, thus the steward looked away, the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for the four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So we purpose in our heart not to be defiled, to obey the Lord at all costs. That invites a test of our faith. If we hold to the Lord, we'll have victory. Faith comes in, in our faith, overcomes the world. And as a result of that, we get blessing from the Lord. So these four men, because they held to the Lord's uh, word, God blesses them with knowledge, literary, literature, uh, understanding of literature, wisdom, and Daniel has a special gift of understanding visions and dreams. These are young men, and God is equipping them to do great things. What might God equip us to do if we purpose in our heart not to be filed and disobey him, and then be willing when the test comes, to stand firm in our faith and not be moved. Uh, the victory is in Christ, and he blesses those who do so, and God is blessing. I just love the way God's working in the hearts of men here. He's working in the heart of the eunuch master, uh, showing favor to the Jews. He's equipping these young men to stand firm, and as a result, he's blessing them. And as we're going to see, in the end, God is going to get the glory. Now, at the end of the days, what is that? According to verse 5, this would be likely the three-year period of training and development that these young men were to go through. So at the end of these days, when the king had said they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. So this is the day for three years that a critical day in the lives of these Jewish young men would they will be examined by the king. Would they be found favorable and enter into service or would they be demoted or possibly even executed if they didn't live up to the king's standards? Then the king interviewed them and among them all none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all of his realm. Thus Daniel continued unto the first year of the king of Cyrus. Seventy years. So if Daniel was, let's say, at this point in time, at the end of chapter 11, maybe 
16, 17 years of age, uh, maybe he was deported at 12, 14, 15 years of age, uh, he's going to be serving uh, in the king's court, in Cyrus's court, uh, in his mid-80s. And he's going to have uh, an incredible testimony. The Bible doesn't record anything that Daniel did uh, wrong. Uh, he was a godly man his entire life. So in just reviewing this chapter, this is clearly a, 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 a stressful situation for these young Jewish men. We've seen what the enemy wants. He wants uh, natural abilities to be used for his cause and not the Lord's cause. He wants to control our speech and communication. He wants to cause us to compromise holiness because that is blasphemy, blasphemes the name of the Lord. And he wants to strip away our identity of who we are in Christ. Give us a new identity which would honor him. Understanding what the enemy wants, uh, believers are to purpose in their heart not to be defiled, not to be moved off the truth, not to undermine in any way their understanding of who they are in Christ. If we do that, there will be a test of our faith. If we rest in the Lord, there will be victory and blessings that follow. And the blessings that follow only enhance our opportunity to serve the Lord and to bring honor to his name. So when these young men were examined by Nebuchadnezzar, they were found ten times better than all the magicians and other astrologers. Um, God had blessed them. It wasn't in the food. Uh, it wasn't in the training. Uh, God had blessed them uh, with great abilities that would be used in the coming years to uh, bring his name, honor, and glory. The same is true for us. If we just purpose in our heart to not be defiled, to go on with the Lord, even in stressful times, um, God will be honored in it. Lord, we're thankful for this chapter. This gives us real hope for passing through times of trial, the, the furnace, so to speak. We pray, Father, that we would understand the enemy is very busy in trying to cause compromise. And uh, we pray that we'd have no part with it. We just purpose in our heart to hold to the truth, to not be defiled. Uh, Lord, we realize that you can give us the help to do that. And in the end, your name will be honored. And we will be bettered, better and able to serve you and bring you honor and glory. We pray our whole life would be like this, just a growing experience with you that we might become more fruitful and profitable in your service. So we thank you all for the example of Daniel and his friends. Uh, we pray too that as the world looks upon us, they might see men and women of God much more desirable and intelligent and wise than all the, the children of the devil in the world. To this end, Lord, we just want to be used for your honor and glory. We give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.